Okay, so here we are, one week into 2023. Helen and I were chatting this last week and commenting that the way in which we label and measure time is actually quite arbitrary, isn't it? I mean, New Year's Day was just one day following the previous day, and the fact that we call it New Year's Day was a completely human construct. This is an artificial time that we choose to mark the passing of time. In the Old Testament, dates were measured from when the reign of a king started, which meant that um, Israel and Judah called the same year by a different name, which for us is a bit confusing. Here's an example or a few examples from 1 Kings 22 and verse 41. Jehoshaphat, son of Asa, became king of Judah in the fourth year of Ahab, king of Israel. Or Ahaziah, son of Ahab, became king of Israel in Samaria in the 17th year of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, and he reigned over Israel two years. 2 Kings 18.9. In King Hezekiah's fourth year, which was the seventh year of Hoshea, son of Eliah, king of Israel, Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, marched against Samaria and laid seed against it. Now, it's not an exact science, and it takes a bit of chronological detective work to calculate the date to match the way we measure years, but the commentaries tell me that the fourth year of the reign of Hezekiah and the seventh year of Hoshea refers to 704 BC. Now, wouldn't it be a lot easier if the writer of Samuel had just said, in the year 704 BC, this happened? Oh, some of you thinking, no, I don't work like that. Well done. But our calendar, of course, is based on the birth of another king, the king of kings, Jesus. So AD is Latin for Anno Domino. So we are in the 2023rd year of King Jesus. That's how they would have measured the year if we were Old Testament people. Uh, except for the fact that those who tried to work out when Jesus was born got it wrong, and he was actually born in 4 BC. Hmm. And uh, 4, 5, or 6 BC. In fact, um, Southwest Television interviewed me as an expert on this um, when, the, when the millennium, in 2001, when they had an expert on to tell them it wasn't the millennium, it had happened some time ago. And, I, and if I could have found it, and if the kit had been working, I could have shown a younger version of me <laughs> walking into the church, and there's a silly... I was trying not to smile because it's about the fifth or sixth time they did this take of me walking seriously into the church with the cameras on me. What a hoot that was. I, and how I kept a straight face at the end, I've really no idea. But anyway, yes. So the way that we calculate time is actually a bit arbitrary. Uh, and in fact, of course, we ourselves calculate different years anyway. So for Sandra, there's the academic year, which starts in September and runs through then into, the, into, into July. And if you're an accountant, well, you've got the financial or tax year that is, again, different from the calendar year. So we're used to the fact that we can sometimes think of time uh, differently. Now then, telling you all this is to illustrate that how we divide things up, in fact, can be a bit arbitrary, even when it's done for the sake of convenience. And it's the same with our Bibles. Now, it was drummed to me at, in both school and Sunday school that there were how many books in the Bible? 66 books in the Bible. There were 39 in the Old Testament. And so you do your math, 66 minus, so there must be 27 in the New Testament. Except that it would be more accurate to say that that is how many there are in our English Protestant translations of the Bible. But you might remember me telling you, or you might not, I think it was last year, that there are actually five books of Psalms in our Bibles. Yeah? How many do you remember me telling you that? Oh, so impressed. Is it almost into double figures there? Yes, and if you look at the book of Psalms, you'll find that within the book of Psalms that we think of as one book, there are actually five books of Psalms. So there's one Psalms, two Psalms, three Psalms, four Psalms, and five Psalms. So, if we didn't count them as one, then actually there are 70 books in the Bible. But then, 
in the original Hebrew, 1 and 2 Samuel is just Samuel. So that's now 69 books in the Bible. And 1 and 2 Kings were just kings. And actually, 1 and 2 Samuel and 1 and 2 Kings form one long narrative and could be counted as one. And like you, I've now lost count. Now, why, oh, why am I telling you this? Because I want to highlight just how important the opening of 1 Samuel is, and especially 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 1, through to 1 Samuel 2, verse 11. By the way, Chapter breaks are also modern devices for convenience, or in this case, inconvenience, because chapter one should really have ended at what is now chapter two and verse 11. I hope you're remembering all this, because you're going to get tested at some point. Okay. Most books, <laughs> you've got to stay with me with this, all right. Most books usually have a preface or an introduction in which the author might tell you something about what is going to come in what has been written, or somebody else writes to tell you what their friend, the author, has written, and it's great, and you really should read it. Uh, it sort of explains their purpose, and it gives readers an idea of what to expect as they go on. And that is true of what we know as 1 and 2 Kings, uh, 1 and 2 Samuel, and 1 and 2 Kings, which... Did I just tell you can be thought of as one book? Did I have to remember to mention that? Yeah, some of you remember me mentioned it. <laughs> some of you are completely confused. Because why was 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, written together to form one volume, written in the first place? Well, it's to tell a story of how the loose affiliation or federation, we might call it these days, a bit like the United States of America, there there were the United Tribes of Israel, there were 12 tribes of Israel. It does tell the story of how that loose affiliation of 12 tribes moved from the ad hoc leadership of the charismatic figures known as judges, and their exploits are recorded in the book that bears that name, so that's easy enough, um, and how they came together under one king. First of all, Saul, then David, and then Solomon. And then it's the story of how all that unraveled, became unstuck after Solomon's death, split into two. You had the ten tribes going north, the capital city Samaria, known as Israel, which is a bit confusing because sometimes the southern kingdom of Judah is also called Israel, but you've just got to work it out. So 10 tribes went north, they were called Israel, capital city Samaria, and two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, stayed south, capital city Jerusalem. And from then on, as we've seen, the same year would have two dates, according to when the king of Israel or the king in Judah started their reigns, and hence where in the Bible, in the fourth year of so-and-so, which was the seventh year of so-and-so, this happened. It's the story of how things went downhill over the centuries. First for Israel, who were conquered and went into exile under the Assyrian Empire, and then a century or so later, how Judah uh, from the south followed suit and were conquered by the, the then new kid on the block, the Babylonian Empire, and they were taken into, uh, into exile. And the Assyrian Empire, that's basically where uh, Iraq is now, and the Babylonian Empire is basically Iran in today's terms of, of geography. Now it's history, but it's more than just a narrative of events. It's an explanation of why it happened. 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings are where theology and history are joined at the hip. You see, once they were in exile in Babylon, the faith of God's people was shattered. Psalm 137, in my head I'm already singing Boney M's version of this. By the rivers of Babylon, yeah, most of you know it. Uh, by the rivers of Babylon we sat and wept when we remembered Zion, Jerusalem, hundreds of miles away. 
There on the poplars we hung our harps, for there our captors asked us for songs. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy. They said, sing us one of the songs of Zion. I can imagine the contempt with which that was said to them. And the psalmist says, how can we sing the songs of the Lord in a strange, in a foreign land? You see, everything on which their faith had been built was shattered. Jerusalem was in ruins. The temple was a pile of rubble. So there were no more priests. There were no more sacrifices. There was no longer even a king who was descended from David. So what had happened to all those promises of God that they would be a people in their land and they would have a king descended from David forever? What had gone wrong? Why had they become the taunt of their enemies? And they couldn't help but ask the question, okay, was was God somehow powerless to stop it? Or if it wasn't that, had he just torn up the covenant? Had God proved to be either unfaithful or incompetent? And was there any hope for the future at all? By the rivers of Babylon, we sat down and we wept when we remembered Zion. How, how can we sing the joyful songs of the Lord in an alien land? One and two Samuel and one and two Kings were written to answer that question. It's a long answer. You see, drawing on various historical sources, we find the editor or editors, compilers of Samuel Kings, offering an explanation for the past, but also hope for the future. And Hannah's song puts down a marker right at the start of this grand narrative. I mean, they could easily have left out the detail of what Hannah sang. She, you could tell the story without her at all. You could have just said, uh, a lad called Samuel was born who became a great prophet. And there you've summarized two chapters. And the storyline would still be intact. You see... Hannah's song of praise tells about the God who is behind the stories that will be told in the next 101 chapters. What this God stands for, who he is, what makes him God. And so in this song, we find Hannah celebrating God. She celebrates a God who can turn sorrow into joy. Well, those who sat by the rivers of Babylon need to hear that sort of God, who could perhaps turn their sorrow into joy. There's another prayer of of Hannah in 1 Samuel 10. Uh, verse chapter 1 verse 10 in her deep anguish we are told Hannah prayed to the Lord weeping bitterly how well that related to the exiles they too were weeping bitterly and we see Hannah then finding new strength as Nehemiah was later to put it the joy of the Lord is your strength let me stop there does anyone here this morning do you need your joy in the Lord renewing at the start of this year then turn to the God whom Hannah here celebrates, in whom your joy can be found. Hannah also celebrates a God who is in charge. She would have wonderfully joined in with the actions, our God is a great big God. She she knew what it was to be in his hands. She knew that God was overall in charge. Do you know what God is overall in charge without taking any advice from you and me? (laughs) Can you imagine that? Oh, I'm glad of that, actually. God is working his purpose out as year succeeds to year. And the day will come when the glory of the Lord shall cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. You see, however bad things get, God has not abdicated his throne. Now, for the exiles in Babylon, that was a statement of faith because it didn't look that way. It looked as if God had abdicated. 
And sometimes it doesn't look that way to us. And saying that God is in charge is a statement of faith because it's not what we see. As the writer to the Hebrew puts it, without faith it's impossible to please God. Can you imagine the joy in God's heart when he sees people saying, Lord, I still believe in you. I still have faith in you. Even the world around me and all my circumstances are daring me to still believe in you and trust in you. And God can say, look at so-and-so on the earth. Look at what they're going through. And they still trust. And the angels rejoice. And I'm sure that was what was going on in the story of Job. <laughs> if you know the story of Job in the Old Testament. This morning, do you need your trust in God's sovereignty to be renewed? Then turn to the God whom Hannah here celebrates. Hannah also knew that this God is holy and holds rebels to account. Now, let's be honest, we'd like God to be a soft, cuddly toy who wouldn't hurt a fly, wouldn't we? Before being carted off into exile, these people read in Samuel and Kings had been told by false prophets that God was not in the business of this discipline in them, that God would never be in the business of punishing them for their obstinate sinful rebellion against him and his law. And so you find Jeremiah pointing out that the prophets were saying, look, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, as long as this temple stands, God will not abandon us. Jeremiah, you do not know what you're talking about. Shut up, throw them down the pit. But God's holiness means that he can't overlook human sin and rebellion forever and a day. If you put yourself on a collision course with the holiness of God, there's only ever going to be one winner. And perhaps that may be exiles think. Had we put ourselves on collision course with the holiness of God by ignoring him, his law, his prophets? Well, now look at it. Do you need to factor into your life this morning a renewed sense of the holiness of God and turn to the God whom Hannah here celebrates. This God was also a God who opposed the proud and arrogant and exalted the poor and needy. Someone proud and arrogant had made Hannah's life a misery. Like Hannah's other wife taunted her mercilessly, but now it seems the tables were turned. And I think Hannah would have voiced a hearty amen to the Apostle Peter's words century later, centuries later. All of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. You need to do something with your anxieties and cares this morning. Cast them on the God Hannah here celebrates. But you know what? I think there's more going on here than just Hannah rejoicing in her own change of fortunes. Because actually, when you read them, you can't help, at least not, can't help get the impression that she rather overstates the case. <laughs> yes, you know, her circumstances have changed, but then she's generalizing it in a huge way. Well, it seems to me that her words, inspired by the Spirit, are designed to tell a bigger story that made them fit as the grand introduction to the whole of Samuel Kings. You see, in her prayer, in chapter 1, well, it drew its words from what God had done for the people of Israel as a whole. And this might have been easier for you to see if the screen was working, but bear with me. This is what um, Hannah prayed. She vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget.
forget your servant. The key little phrase there, if you will, look on the affliction of your servant. Okay, look on the affliction. This was language that those reading in Babylon would immediately have recognized. It was like a buzz phrase. They were words which heralded the rescue of God's people from Egypt centuries before. I'm going to give four examples. There's four, it could be more. From Exodus, Deuteronomy, and Nehemiah. I have surely seen the affliction of my people, says the Lord. When they heard that the Lord had seen their affliction, they bowed their heads and worshipped. The Lord saw our affliction. You saw the affliction of our fathers in Egypt. You get that little phrase, seeing the affliction of his people. And that's what the language that Hannah uses. Hannah was asking God to do for her something akin to what he had done for Israel in the days of Moses. The exiles now in Babylon needed God to do something for them akin to what he had done for Israel in the days of Moses. And so the editor, the compiler of Samuel King, saw in Hannah's experience, if you like, a personification of God's people now in exile. It expressed an understanding of God and his ways that they needed to take on board and which would explain the downhill story into exile that had resulted when two kings concluded its history with the words, so Judah was taken into exile out of its land. Why had it happened? It had happened because of the character of the God and a celebrate who had warned his people, you live like that and I will send you into exile. It wasn't that God had abdicated his fault. It wasn't that God had torn up the covenant. It wasn't that God was incompetent. It was God being God. And that's the story of those 101 chapters with that God at the beginning. The preface, the introduction, the explanation of why these awful things have happened to them and how it was all their own fault. And that God had warned them again and again and again until enough was enough. Bear with me further. It's been very good. This magnificent theological introduction to centuries of history right, comes from the lips of a woman. Okay, now stop and think. Given the patriarchal context of its day, it's impossible to overstate the significance of Hannah's song as introducing centuries of history. Which leads me back to calendars and dates. Now listen very carefully or I'll say it more than once. Hannah was the mother of Samuel and Samuel was getting on a bit when he picked out David as the youngest son of Jesse, who would one day become king instead of Saul. So, Hannah's story is set towards the end of the days of Judges, perhaps two generations to go, towards the end. At about the same time, another woman by the name of Naomi set out from the land of Moab to return to Bethlehem. And her story is told in the book of Ruth. And of course, Ruth was the grandmother of David. So, in two different parts of the world, using what the world would regard as non-entities of women, God was preparing the ground big time. Paul said, God chose the things the world regards as 
foolish to shame the wise. He chooses the weak things of this world to overturn the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world, the despised things, and the things are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. So at this absolutely pivotal moment in salvation history, women aren't small walk-on bit part players. They're right center stage. I hope you sense the significance of that from literature that was written centuries ago when it was a patriarchal men almost only society. God chose to use women to yabu the patriarchal will. Sometimes when preachers say lastly they last, sometimes when they say finally will they actually finish. So I'm going to say finally. Where do these words of Hannah surface again centuries later? They are on the lips of another lowly, humble woman, recorded for us in Luke chapter 1 and verses 46 to 55. Mary, the mother of Jesus. As she bursts into song when she greets her cousin Elizabeth and she tells Elizabeth what the angel has told her. And her song is inspired by Hannah's. Listen, Mary said, my soul glorifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble estate of his servant. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has scattered those who are proud in the inmost thought, etc., etc. Living echoes of Hannah's song from centuries before are on the lips of Mary, the mother of Jesus. It's as if Luke is trying to get over to his readers. Here, God is finishing what he started with Hannah. So Hannah's song serves not only as an introduction to the story that Samuel Kings was to tell. It also serves to set the scene for Jesus and therefore for our salvation today. Can you guess the next word I typed on my computer after I wrote that sentence. One word, three letters, with an exclamation mark at the end. Any takers? Wow. Yeah. Wow. A something of the hugeness and the glory and the wonder of how God does things has hit me. Reading a passage of scripture I've read many times before, but has never hit me so hard as it did this last week. In a good way, it hit me. <laughs> Lost in wonder, love, and praise. Mary, it seems, knew what Hannah knew. And the God that Hannah celebrated was the God that Mary celebrated. Do you know what? He's our God too. So when we've just sung that he is with us through this year, this is the God who is with us through this year. God of Hannah, the God of Mary, was, of course, the God of Jesus, too. So let us enter this year. When there was a lot of unknown. We didn't know at the beginning of last year that Putin was going to invade in February. We didn't know this, that, and the other. And once in 2022 was an awful year, off the back of a couple of awful years. And we can't be sure that 2023 won't be even more awful again. We, we don't. That's the fact. It might be better. It might be worse. But whether it's better or worse, I hope you remember, whatever you remember about the fourth year of Z Dillard, and the, which was the tenth year of the Lord, so and so, and this, and all, and remember this. This is our God. And we can trust him just as Hannah did.